When last we left, it looked like the services economy in the United States was somewhat weak, maybe heading in the wrong direction, maybe even doing so out of sequence. Because normally when we see an economy move from expansion to contraction, there's usually the inventory cycle, manufacturing goods, and then weaknesses in services shows up and sort of confirms or makes the recession happen. Well, this time, as we talked about last week with my good buddy Stephen Van Meter here, who's joining us today, we talked about how it was the service economy that seems to be leading the weakness. And over this shortened holiday week in the United States, we had Thanksgiving, thank you, thankfully, Thanksgiving last week. We got some more services data that suggests, yeah, there is something going on in the U.S. services economy, which not isn't just about the U.S. service economy. It's more about how that represents what's going wrong for the entire global economy. If the U.S., I mean, services spending is supposed to be the major support for not just the U.S. economy, but for much of the much of the economic activity around the world. So, Steve, we got some more data on the U.S. services economy, and it was not just not good, but much, much worse than expected, right? Yeah, Jeff, and I think this is important for people to understand, you know, when we say there's a concern here, there's a pretty big one, because normally the way things should work is the services sector should lag the manufacturing sector. Now, for those who are tr struggling with that, think about you've got a factory, money is flowing into it because there's new orders, there's a demand, and that money comes out of the factory. Your know, workers get paid, they, the factory needs services, and that flows out into mostly into the services economy. So normally you want to see things where if there is an acceleration or deceleration in the manufacturing sector, we'll wait a couple months and we should get confirmation from the services sector. But we've got a problem, Jeff, because for some reason, an unknown reason, maybe that you could help us here. Back in March of this year, both the manufacturing and the services sectors have slowed down. We can, we continue to see them kind of gradually drop off, pop up, and okay, hey, everything's okay. And then, oh, no, 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 come back down, pop again. And now we're on another downtrend. And this time, it looks like we've got no monetary stimulus. We've got no fiscal stimulus. And the holiday season will be behind us pretty soon. Maybe this trend doesn't get a pop and we're actually facing something much worse going into the first quarter. Yeah, that's an important point too, Steve. When we look at the data, especially the high frequency data, it tends to be extremely noisy. And depending on the survey, it can be ridiculously noisy where one month it looks really bad. The next month it looks like, okay, everything's fine. And then the next month it's back and forth. And you have to, as you said in a recent video that you did on your channel, you have to look at the trends. You got to look at the overall trend and see where it's going. Maybe take a four month average, something like that, because this, this data, the high frequency data is extremely noisy. However, when we look at some of these things, even despite the month to month noise, you can see where the high side in that variation isn't very good. And then the low side is like, holy crap. You kind of know where the trend is. And we're talking about the S&P Global Services, what used to be called IHS Market, which kind of shocked everyone a couple months ago when their services PMI actually plummeted way down into around 46, which is something you only see in not just recession, but some of the deeper recessions like 2020 or 2008, 2009. But then in the month of, let's see, that would have been the August, September, the S&P, or was it, uh, no, August, and then September was higher, and then we went back lower in August. Well, how did it go, Steve? It was, September was bad, October was good, and now November's back down again. Okay, I got it. So we had a really awful number in September, and everybody said, okay, this is not good. But then it bounced back up closer to 50 again in October, and then the new data for the month of, the flash reading for the month of November, we got for the services. 46.1, which is incredibly low. And as you said, Steve, we should be seeing manufacturing weaken much, much uh, before we see services. We got that too, and we'll get to that in a minute. But the services economy seems to be much weaker. And as you said, something happened in March, which, I mean, we all know what happened in March. That was the last price, uh, spike in oil prices, which meant that gasoline prices went through the roof and then continued to go higher which pressured not just consumers, but also services industry, services businesses that have to pay for those costs. And they're not able to pass those costs or at least most of those costs onto their consumers. So the services economy has been profit pressured for quite a, quite some time already. 
And now we're starting to see the weakness really start to manifest. And it's not just no. Now it seems like, Steve, it doesn't seem like it's reversed here because now we have weaknesses and services, which is causing a spillover effect maybe into the goods economy, right? Yeah, exactly, Jeff, because w- what we were hoping here, or at least you know, what the political elites are all trying to tell us is, hey, we're going to have a strong holiday season. And you you look to the services sector because it employs so many people. And it's really easy. And in manufacturing, you, you have someone who's trained in a job. You're not going to just put them out on the unemployment line at the first hint of a slowdown. You might furlough them. You might do some things. But if you've got some part-time workers that are not skilled and your business is slowing down, real easy to say, hey, you know what? I don't need you. I can train someone else in like two days. So, or maybe I'll get you back later. But it's easy to get rid of people. So what we would want to see going into a holiday season is really the services sector shining here that may actually transmit back, as you said, into the goods sector going into the first part of next year and kind of turn this whole system around. But this time, Jeff, we're not seeing that at all. In fact, it kind of concerns me because now we might see an acceleration of unemployment claims going into the end of the year. And that's not something I thought. I thought we would see that perhaps maybe mid-December. And then we got the initial claims data from last week, 240 missing expectations of around 223 or 225. And that's all this, a number that's going in the wrong direction all of a sudden. But we talked about that you know, weeks ago that, hey, it's, it's coming back down, but watch out if it starts to shoot higher. And now we're getting this data from the services sector. It's all coming together. Something's seriously wrong here. Yeah, and it's funny because where do we see the, you know, the matching the unemployment claims to corporate announcements? Where do we see companies laying off? It's in the services economy. So this, we're, we're matching the PMI data. And there was also another one from the Richmond Fed which was also negative and negative is not a number you want to see in any of these regional fed services surveys either. So we got PMI data, sentiment data that says something's really wrong in services. We've got companies in the services sector saying we're laying off workers. And now we've got jobless claims rising for the second time this year. Let me give you a counterpoint though. When everybody, whenever we bring up jobless claims, most people will say, well, yeah, so what? 240,000, that's nothing. That's historically low. Uh, Even continuing claims, which spiked up to a million and a half, almost 1.6 million, that's also nothing. If you look at uh, continuing claims in, say, the pre-crisis era, you would see them regularly at 2 million. So do we really care that jobless claims at 240,000 or continuing claims are at 1.6 million, even though it's consistent with all this other data that we're seeing that maybe this is not really that big of a deal? Well, relative to history, you're right, Jeff. No big deal. But it's not because we we saw something different here. We're now we're coming off some very low numbers, and that's the concern. So I think, like you're saying, is maybe this isn't a big deal, and that's what policymakers kind of want us to believe is, well, hey, we're we're just back kind of where we've been for decades. So what's the big deal? Well, it's a huge deal when you come off a very low level, or in the case of these. PMI surveys, very high levels, and you see them come down, it tells you the trend is slowing. Now, the the question that we should be asking here is, is the economy actually strong enough to come back to these levels and then cool off, which is what the Fed wants, and then kind of resume normal trend? Or is this trend going to accelerate? That's the big fear that is if this continues. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that we want to emphasize here is that during these periods where it looks like the economy might be slowing down, it can be very confusing. It gets very ambiguous because you look at, like like you just said, Steve, jobless claims. Jobless claims, if you look at them in isolation or in a vacuum, 240,000, that's nothing. But you're right. It's 240,000 is more than what it was in March when they started to rise again. We're looking at the, tra- the change in trend. We're saying, okay, jobless claims are starting to rise again. Does that represent the economy just kind of cooling off or does it represent the beginning of something more serious? Which means you have to put it into the context of everything else that you're seeing. And so everything else that we're seeing with these sentiment data, especially in the services sector, we're seeing mass layoff announcements in the services sector. It's not just that jobless claims are 240,000, it's that they're rising consistent with all these other signs, warning signs that we see throughout the economy. Uh, We talk endlessly about the yield curve and Eurodal and all these inversions, which really puts a a, a bow on the context here. I also want to throw one more potential 
bit of context on top. Let's talk about the FOMC minutes that were released last week. Because the FOMC minutes kind of made it seem, and of course, if if a theme here is ambiguity, there's nothing more ambiguous than a Fed statement, right? Because as Alan Greenspan famously said before, if you if I'm talking and you and you hear something substantial out of my mouth, then I didn't say it right. Because the Fed does not want to, that's what Fed speak is. They, they never want to say something substantial. But if you read between the lines, you can see, and I think you agree with me, Steve, you can see that there's there's a debate now. Whereas a couple of months ago, maybe there wasn't a debate. The CPIs were all red hot. Jay Powell was a screaming hawk and everybody else agreed with him. Now, even this highly sanitized, scrubbed, for public consumption minutes that they put out this, this past week, Contain. Let me read the. Let me read the statement because I think that's important uh, to really get the sense of what we're talking about. The statement in the minutes said a substantial majority of participants judged that a slowing in the pace of increase in rate hikes would likely soon be appropriate. A substantial majority of participants. Now we could read into what that actually means. But what it says is that you know uh, James Bullard said rates got to go higher. Jay, uh, Jay Powell said the same thing, but the a substantial majority of participants are thinking maybe we need to back off here. And the question is, why would they be thinking that? Right, Steve? Yeah, and of course. And either they think inflation is going to come way down. Right, Jeff? And there's and, and from Fed's perspective, because we can look at some forward looking indicators and say, OK, all right, the yield curve, gasoline prices, there, there's factors out there that suggest it's coming down. But but from the lens of the Fed, there's virtually zero chance that that's going to happen. Um, you have to look at from the other side of it. And this is the, you know, potentially the manufacturing base at the regional level. But more importantly, you know, you look at the labor market. That, that's, of course, their you know, mandate. But we do know the Fed does look at the manufacturing base in their area. And we've seen in the past when these PMIs start to drop, you know, near 50 and even worse below, they're not paused, they're cutting. So this is very, very unusual. And what I want our audience to understand here is these minutes, as Jeff said, are very highly sanitized to the point is they're actually rewritten to fit whatever narrative that they need to push now. So if the Fed thought that they were going to get away with further hikes, then these minutes would reflect that. So what happens is they have their press conference, you know, they come up with their plan. Powell goes out, says whatever he's going to say, drops the hammer repeatedly. So everybody makes sure. And then between that time and the release of the minutes, if they have a change in view or they think the market's view is shifting or anything that might shift coming up, the minutes get rewritten. Jeff, that's not something a lot of people know. They think this is the actual minutes. And I think what we're trying to say is, look, look between the meeting and now and how hawkish they were. And all of a sudden, we're starting to see this shift with the speakers this last week. They're not hawkish at all. They were talking maybe now 50 or even maybe even less. Do you remember, Steve, back in late 2018, kind of, you know, along the same lines here, the final rate cut in that cycle was December, middle of December 2018. And after the Fed uh, hiked rates for the final time, they didn't think it was the final time because Jay Powell in his press conference said, this is not the final time. And then the minutes came out after that meeting and it was all of a sudden Fed pause, Fed pause, Fed pause, Fed pause. And it's exactly the same thing that you saw because the narrative at the actual meeting was inflation, rate hikes are going to continue. And then, of course, at the same time, remember what was going on in the marketplace. we got inversions. we got massive inversion in Euro futures. we got WTI contango. All the warning signs that we see today happened at the same time. And then early January, all of a sudden, it was the minutes came out and the ma substantial majority of participants. They didn't actually say that, but that, you know, reading between the lines, it was the same kind of thing where the Fed minutes came out. And it sounded like a, a, an ex a, a completely different meeting. These minutes did not this didn't seem to describe the meeting that actually happened in December. And I wonder if, you know, I think that's the point here is we're trying to get through all this ambiguity and confusion. If the Fed, like late in 2018 into 2019, is starting to realize that maybe the economic fundamentals that they thought was 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 taking place, maybe that's already changed. And that these Fed surveys, as you pointed out, the manufacturing surveys. They've been bad for quite some months, and now we see S&P Global's manufacturing survey plunge well underneath 50, unexpectedly. It was supposed to, supposed to be around 50. Suddenly, it's 47-something. So maybe the Fed is starting to get the sense that mm, late, late 2018, the economy is 
maybe a little bit weaker and a little bit less potential than they thought. Yeah, that's right, Jeff. And then you look at from the market perspective, all of a sudden stocks are starting to get excited because what do they love? Hey, if the Fed's going to pause potentially, then that means now we're closer to a cut. And of course, there's nothing stocks love more than Fed cutting. But the bond market, as we we're talking about before the show, we see more inversions. Now we see everything five years and above, five, seven, 10, 20, 30. They're all below the one month and we're seeing longer rates start to fall. So what we're seeing is not only is the stock market getting excited that the Fed's cutting, the bond market saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, we're pretty sure that in December, whatever, whatever they're been spinning, it's probably going to be less. You know, I know they've been pretty set at 50 basis points, Jeff. I'm thinking we may get down to 25. Maybe it's possible or a pause. We've got the non-farm payroll coming up. We've got another CPI report. I think what we're hearing in the minutes is the speakers are looking for an excuse to pause. They don't have it yet, but they want it. Yeah, and I think that's probably a really good point to end on here is that before we get to the next Fed meeting, which the markets are sort of pricing continued rate hike, but there's a lot of, again, uncertainty surrounding what that will look like. And I think you're right because, again, going back to the FOMC statement, a substantial majority of participants are looking for an excuse to, take the, to become doves, to take the pressure off. And if we see the CPI do like it, uh, perform like it had in October, where it was kind of confirming that this, the worm has turned here, then that could be a big one that that, that that brings the Fed back down to maybe 50, 25. I don't know about a Fed pause. I think there's too many hawks, um, but that's that's certainly coming up. And then the, the payroll report. Now, the payroll report expectations, we were talking about this before we started the show. They're still relatively good in, in like jobless claims in the historical context, right? Their expectation is plus 200,000. But what if we get a, a really bad number there? Or we get another household survey contraction, which uh, historically speaking has been a much better predictor of the actual economy. And then there's another another factor too, is that uh, companies are going to come out and say, you know, we told you re the Christmas holiday season was bad. Maybe it was worse than expected. Although I kind of expect that a lot of retailers are going to say, well, we, th we told you it was going to be bad. It actually wasn't as bad as we thought, you know. The old game of re reducing your earnings expectations so that you can beat it by a penny. So there's a lot more to be confused about over the months or over the couple of weeks ahead, and only a few a few windows where we can get some kind of clarity. Yeah, that's right, Jeff. So I think we'll be focused on you know for those who are wondering what we're going to be looking at. Definitely the CPI report, as you mentioned, the non-farm payroll. Not because we care about the actual headline. We know it's likely to decelerate. We're going to be watching the household survey. And of course, we'll talk about that. And we're also going to watch these initial claims. If you start to see initial claims continue to tick up, you know, if, I want everyone to understand is that these Fed, you know, regional uh, members, they're actually, you know, talk to the major employers in their area. And if people start to get unhappy about something, they're going to pick up the phone and call the head of their regional Fed and say, hey, you know what, your policies are causing me undue harm, which really translate is to they're making less money. Let's be realistic here. So if they start getting a lot of calls like that, hey, guess what? By December, they're going to look for any excuse to do anything other than 50 basis points. And I think what, what we're like, you're right. I think the retail sales come down, but I also think that you're right. They're going to somehow spin that and say, hey, not so bad. Again, we've got a lot of things set up here to not only see equities rally for a while longer, but interest rates to come down. The big question is, will the Fed pause in December? That'll be interesting. There's a chance they could, but we don't know yet. Yeah, we're still still too much confusion and ambiguity, not enough real data. But in times like this, as we always talk about, Steve, this is where we really depend upon market forces because the market is far, far smarter than we are. There's far much, far more, more valuable information in these markets. So it's usually a, a good bet to depend on the signals you're getting from, from the curves. And as you said, Steve, some of these are just absolutely ridiculous or, you know, almost historic levels of inversion, which really gives you a good sense. Even if we don't know when it happens, we kind of have a really good idea what happens if we don't, we don't quite have the clarity on when yet. Okay. So thanks for joining me again, Steve. We'll talk to you again next week. Thanks, Jeff. It was a pleasure and I'll look forward to next week. Okay. Take care.